you your name <clears throat> when you were born. And I thought of having a, a breakout community discussion to, to ask if you like your name or what would you have preferred your name to be? I, I know a number of people have expressed that they have not been a big fan of their name and they've gone with a second name, their middle name instead. Um, I even know some people that go by a name that is not on their birth certificate at all. It's a very different name. Um, I heard the other day that uh, parents are starting to call their little girls Nevea. Nevea, that's kind of pretty. It's heaven backwards. And I thought about it. I, I, I just think that kid's in for a lot of conversations as a child. My name means heaven backwards. No, not that. It doesn't mean the other direction to heaven. It, it's heaven backwards. Anyway, a lot of, a lot of conversations. Um, but your name's important to you, right? And it's important to those who love you and call you by that name. We're going to learn a little bit about what that would even mean. I, I, I know in the Bible times, both Old Testament and New Testament, a name was very significant. It was very, very connected to a person's identity even. Whereas in our culture, it's more of an identifier and less of an identity issue. But we're going to really talk about a story in Luke 19 that is connected to identity through a name. So our names are identifiers of us. They don't tend to be our identity. Um, I know we talk about this often, that in this culture that we live in, people's identities are connected a lot to their accomplishments, to their achievements, um, to you know, their social media presence, how many likes or hits they get, how much of an influencer they are that's tied up with uh, identity. And even now, you know, people's sexuality is so tied up with their identity. Um, but God says, let me call you your name and let me give you your identity. And so that's what we're going to process this morning. And we're going to do it in a very kind of fun way, I think. We're going to hear from a youth leader and seven of his youth all the way from Wales, UK. And uh, so some of you know that Karen and I were over there for a couple of weeks. And so in case you've never seen our uh, eldest, this is our son, Jay, and our daughter by marriage for 14 years to Jay, Michelle. And then this is little Concord. His picture is not really out there on social media. Jay and I actually got out golfing. It was hard to do so because the, the scenery was so incredibly beautiful. We're right on the uh, Irish Sea. But this is also a picture of what our son Jay looks like. Uh, you can't see that very well, but I call it the lion from the Wizard of Oz picture. <laughs> and he's an author, and that picture's right on the, the homepage of jaredbrock.com. So if you want to hear about what he does and what they do, you can see that. But he would tell you that one of the most significant ministries he has in his life right now is leading a group of 12 to 15 year olds. And so this message that we're about to process is only 20 minutes long, but it's, it's packed. And it is Jay with some of the young people in Wales. Bronwyn's been moving us around lately, but this is getting crazy. <clears throat> um, these seven young people have never given a sermon before, so can we give them a hand for their bravery? <laughs> yeah. So guys, sometimes public communicators say, you know, if you're really, really nervous, just picture the audience naked. 
but you can't do that in church. You have to picture them wearing Bibles, okay? That's how it goes. So welcome, Faith family, everyone here live, everyone joining us online, and all you future people who will be watching this on YouTube in the future, um, welcome to Mount Zion. Uh, out of curiosity, how many of you went to Sunday school growing up? Okay, good, all right. So there are some pretty familiar standard Sunday school stories that everyone heard in Sunday school again and again and again. Uh, Sam, what's the big one? David and Goliath. David and Goliath, absolutely. What's another famous one, Rose? Daniel and the lion's den. Daniel and the lion's den, absolutely. Lily? Jonah and the whale. Jonah and the whale. Okay, so so far Sunday school is basically little people getting attacked by big things, right? That's what we've learned. Um, what's what's the, the fourth big one? Um, Zacchaeus up a tree. Zacchaeus up a tree, right. We've all heard the story, a little short man wants to see Jesus, so he climbs a really big tree, and Jesus says, hey, can we do lunch at your house? And he goes, yes, I'm going to give away half my stuff to the poor now? What just happened? Like, it's a very strange, strange story. And so today, we're going to dig back into that text and see if we can't discover some things that might even surprise the adults. How does that sound to you, adults? Yeah? Okay, very good. Hugh, can you please open us up in prayer? Let's bow our heads. God, your word says that when two or three people get together in your name, you are there with them. So we just want to start by taking a moment in silence to invite and acknowledge God's presence. Jesus, we are our apprentices. You are our master. And we want to learn how to love God and love people. Teach us today. Amen. Amen. Phoebe, where are we reading from today? We're reading from Luke 19, 1 to 10. Everyone please turn with us or follow along on the screen. Okay, so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Luke 19. Um, so when we open our Bibles in junior church, as, or as we prefer to call it, senior church, um, we uh, actually just take it back a screen for now, Josh. Um, yeah, just hold it there. Um, we ask a bunch of questions in junior church. The first question is, what is the Bible? So the word Bible comes from a Greek word, biblos, which means books. It's just a library. It's a book of books called Scripture, and it's 66 books written by about 40 authors over 1,500 years, and they're all telling one story, the story of Jesus. We've talked about this before. The whole Old Testament is pointing forward to Jesus. The whole Old Testament is pointing back to Jesus. This is a story about Jesus and the family that he is building. So when we open the Bible, we can't just always read it literally. We can't just read it as fake, made up. It's a little bit of both. There's poetry, there's story, there's narrative, there's history. We have to read the Bible literally, right? We have to have the context. We need to know who wrote it. So whenever we have junior church, before we get to the text, we always try to figure out what is this text actually about. So let's start with the really simple one. Steph, who wrote the book of Luke? Trick question. Trick question? What do you mean, trick question? All four Gospels are technically anonymous. Interesting. Okay, so if you flip in your Bible to Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, they're not actually, it doesn't say by Matthew, by Mark, by Luke, by John. All four Gospels are technically anonymous. Nicely done. That said, based on internal evidence, who do we assume wrote the book of Luke? We're pretty sure it was an educated doctor named Luke the Evangelist. Luke the Evangelist. Interesting. Luke doesn't sound very Jewish. Sam, who was this guy? Luke was a Greek disciple of the Apostle Paul. Interesting. So Luke is a Greek disciple of the Apostle Paul. Very cool. Rose, um, what's so special about Luke, this Greek disciple? He's the only non-Jewish writer in the whole Bible. Luke is the only Jew non-Jewish writer in the entire Bible. Amazing. What else do we know about him? He also wrote the book of Acts, which means Luke wrote over one quarter of all the words in the New Testament, more than any other author. Okay, so Paul writes more books but Luke writes more words. Um, so, Luke, the Greek doctor, evangelist, disciple of Paul, wrote the book of Luke, we think. But what genre is this book? The Bible has law, history, narrative, prophecy, letters. Grace, any idea what genre the book of Luke might be? This one is a narrative, a gospel testimony, a Christ-centered sub-genre of Greek historiography. Okay, there are lots of big words there. So, first of all, narrative. It's a story. It's a gospel, which means it's a God story. 
It's Christ-centered. The authors are very, very clear that they have a bias in writing these books. They want you to believe that Jesus is God. They're very transparent with that. And it's a, Greece, a Greek historiography. It's a history biography. Um, it's written in the exact same style as Herodotus and Thucydides. It's very similar to the Greek and Roman lives that were written at the time. But what makes Luke so special, Hugh? Luke really pays attention to detail. How much detail are we talking about here? Well, the first three verses of Luke 1 suggest that he actually interviewed as many eyewitnesses as he could find, including a number of women in his gospel. It con contains significantly more detail about many women in Jesus' life, including Mary. Okay, so Jesus, or so Luke is really, he actually says that he, that he, he tries to find eyewitnesses, that he tries to put together a detailed account about what is happening. And in, verse, in Luke 1, verse 2, when he says the word eyewitnesses, the Greek word here is autoptai, which is where we get autopsy from. Like he's, he's digging in, he's cutting deep, he really wants to get to the marrow of the story here. Um, okay, Lily, when does the story of Zacchaeus take place? We don't know exactly, but Jesus' public ministry ran around 30 AD to April 3rd, 33 AD. Okay, so roughly in a three-ish year window, roughly 1995 years ago, so just before yesterday. And Sam, do you want to give us the big picture context of our faith family's massive story before we dive in? I'll try. Our Christian family story starts with Abraham, then his son Isaac, then his young son Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel, including Joseph in Egypt. Moses leads the exodus from slavery and Joshua takes Israel into the promised land. Then it's the judges, the kings, the prophets, the Babylonian exile, and the return. Israel is then taken over by Alexander the Great and Caesar in Rome. Okay, so that's where Jesus comes in, right? Exactly. After Jesus, it's the apostles and the early church, and the desert fathers and the Catholics, then the Protestants and then the Baptists, and here we are. Here we are. Okay, so that's our big faith family tree that takes us to today. And today we're looking at a story in the Jesus section of our big story. So, Steph, what's the immediate context of the Zacchaeus story? Jesus and his disciples are walking south from his home region of Galilee on his way to Jerusalem and decide to stop in Jericho along the way. Okay, I'd like to see that on a map. Can we throw up a Google map for a sec? All right, so in the north, you've got the Sea of Galilee. You can see kind of in the middle, um, I've marked it on Google Maps, Sea of Galilee. And on the bottom, you can see Jerusalem. That's where Jesus is ultimately heading. And just to the right, a little bit northeast of Jerusalem. Can everyone see Jericho on that map? I know it's tiny. Can you see Jericho? Yeah. So we know that there was an ancient path that ran along the, the, the uh, River Jordan from the Sea of Galilee all the way down to Jericho. And so we're pretty certain that this is the path that Jesus took. It's downhill most of the way until you get to Jericho, and then it's uphill to Jerusalem. So he decides to stop in Jericho along the way. And I have lost my spot. There we go. Um, what do we know about Jericho, Rose? It was a very busy city thanks to its many water springs. Okay, Hugh, what else? It might be the oldest permanent city in the world. It definitely has the oldest known wall. Okay, so Jericho is this busy, bustling city. It's full of water springs. It's super, super ancient. Maybe the oldest inhabited city in the world. It definitely has the oldest wall. Um, Sam, back to our big picture faith family story. Does Jesus have any personal connections to Jericho? Yes, his ancestor Rahab was from Jericho. Right, Rahab, the prostituted woman who helps Joshua's spies. Does anyone remember the story in the Old Testament? He helps, she helps Joshua's spies actually defeat the city of Jericho as the Israelites take the promised land. This is a very scandalous, non-Jewish woman, but her faith is so strong that her story is no longer about her past. It's about her future. And in fact, she's actually listed quite scandalously as an ancestor of Jesus in Matthew 1 verse 5. So Jesus is familiar with Jericho, and evidently the people in Jericho are familiar with Jesus because they absolutely mob him when he arrives in the city in Luke 19. So if you have your Bibles, Luke 19, shall we read it together? He entered Jericho and was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up onto a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. 
And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Okay, so quick recap. Jesus comes into Jericho, the city of his ancestor Rahab. Zacchaeus is this little short tax collector dude. He can't see Jesus, so he climbs a sycamore tree. He sees Jesus. Jesus stops, says, let's do lunch, bro. And he goes, okay, also, I'm going to give away half my stuff. It's a really strange story. <laughs> Lily, what immediately stands out to you from this story? That Zacchaeus climbs a sycamore tree. Right. That's weird. It's especially weird in Jericho, right, Hugh? Yes, sycamore trees were very rare in Jericho. Deuteronomy 34.4 calls Jericho the city of palm trees. Okay, so this is a city of palm trees, and he's climbing a sycamore tree. I'd love to see a picture of what a sycamore tree looks like. Okay, so we got one up on the screen there. That's called a ficus sy sycamorus. I'm sure Rob Dobney knows all about it on his app. Um, it's sometimes known as a sycamore fig or a fig mulberry tree. Really delicious. It's big and beautiful and it's very easy to climb. I don't know if any of you have tried to try climb a palm tree before, it's very hard. Whereas uh, sycamores, uh, even kids can climb up into sycamore trees and they can grow up to be 60 feet tall. So Zacchaeus is definitely gonna get a good view here. My question is, Rose, what's the spiritual lesson in this tree? Do whatever it takes to see Jesus clearly. We need to be willing to seem ridiculous to others to get a clear view of God. Yes, that's great. People might think it's weird that you climb a tree to see Jesus, or that we pray, or that we read the Bible and study the word with other Christians, or that we try to love our enemies. That's weird, but that's what Christians do. Steph, what sticks out to you? That Zacchaeus is a chief tax collector. Is that a good thing? It's a horrible thing. It's a horrible thing, okay. <laughs> You're right, yeah, Zacchaeus is a traitor to his own people. He is working, he's robbing his own fellow Israelites on behalf of their Roman overlords. And what's interesting is he's not a mere tax collector. In Greek, he is an arctelones. He is the chief tax collector and he's infamously rich. So the historical context here is that Jericho was at the center of a lucrative balsam industry at the time. And Zacchaeus is the monetary bottleneck. He is stealing a pound off of every transaction. And um, he's a Jew who's enriching himself off of the same evil regime that murdered Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. So Jesus has every reason to hate him, and all locals have every reason to hate Zacchaeus. Um, but that's about to change. Uh, okay, Rose, what's the weirdest thing about this story? Definitely verse 5 and 6. Jesus tells Zacchaeus to come down, and Zacchaeus immediately comes down, hosts Jesus and all his disciples for a meal, and then gives away half of everything he owns. Yes, that is absolutely the weirdest thing about this story. I don't know any adult in this room who met Jesus and then was like, I'm giving away half my possessions. Has anyone done that? Did anyone give away half your stuff when you met Jesus? Alex Alcazar did. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> he only had $10 at the time. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's super weird. Um, he, he meets Jesus and he gives, Jesus says, Zacchaeus, let's do lunch. And then he says, okay, I will feed you and all your hungry young disciples. And then I will give away half my stuff. And if I've cheated anyone, I'll give four times what I've stolen. Something must have happened in verse five that changed Zacchaeus' life completely. Evie, do we have any hints on what that was? Zacchaeus doesn't sound like a very Jewish name. Okay, that's interesting. Zacchaeus doesn't sound like a Jewish name. What does it sound like? It sounds like a Greek or Roman name. You're absolutely right. Lots of Greek and Roman names have A-E's in them, including Caesar, Aeneas, Aesop, Alias. It's actually a Latin diphthong, that's a new word for you, diphthong, called Aish, the A-E squished together. What is the Jewish Hebrew equivalent of Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus in Hebrew is Zakai. Zakai. Okay, that's interesting. Lily, what does Zakai mean? It literally means an Israelite. It literally means an Israelite. Okay, so wait, 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 wait hold on. So Zakai means like a true son of Abraham, but this Zakai is using a Romanized version of his name because he's actually a traitor of his own people? Yeah, and the Bible says so. What? what? 
Wait, is this one of those times where the English translations just fail us terribly and we have to go to the original Greek writing to figure out the mystery of why Zacchaeus gave away half of his stuff? Yes. yes. <laughs> in verse 2, Luke calls Zacchaeus Zacchaeus. And in verse 8, Luke calls Zacchaeus Zacchaeus. But Luke pays extreme attention to detail. Evie, what does Jesus call Zacchaeus in verse 5 in the original Greek Bible? Verse 5. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zachai, hurry down, for I must stay at your house today. Guys, this is huge. Jesus knows that Zacchaeus is the chief tax collector, a traitor to Israel, worthy of scorn and shame and hatred. And yet Jesus calls him by his original name, Zachai. You are an Israelite. Jesus knows Zachai's true identity, and it rocks Zacchaeus to the core. What's interesting is that when Jesus called Zachai a true Israelite, he starts acting like a true Israelite. Grace, what does you mean by that? We need to reread verse 8. Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Wait, so, hold on, how is that acting like an Israelite? Well, in the Old Testament, in Exodus 22, if someone stole a sheep, they had to pay back four sheep. Whoa! So, as soon as Jesus calls Zacchaeus a true Jew, he starts acting like a true Jew. So, do we have confirmation that this is the case? Yes, in the very next verse, verse 9, Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. This is really amazing, friends. Even though the crowds write off Zacchaeus as a depraved sinner, Jesus knows Zacchaeus' true identity as being part of our giant faith family. Thank you so much for sharing this, guys. So, okay, as we start to close, Lily, what's the major point of this story? The whole story is summed up in the last verse, verse 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Hallelujah. For the Son of Man, Jesus, came to seek and to save the lost. Even people who are so lost, like Zacchaeus, that they've changed their name and forgotten their true identity. And if Jesus can do that for a traitorous tax collector like Zacchaeus, he can do it for us. If we ask ourselves who we are in the story, we are all Zacchaeus. Jesus invites us to retake our family name. Amen, sister. So, Steph, what becomes of Zacchaeus after Jesus leaves and he gives half of his possessions to the poor? Another trick question. We don't know because the Bible doesn't say. We don't know because the Bible doesn't say. That's right. Um, we don't know what became of Zacchaeus, the tax collector to tax collectors. However, he does seem to have given up his profession as a tax exploiter and put his managerial skills to better work. There's a 4th century apostolic constitution, an ancient church document, that says that he moved 56 miles northwest to Caesarea and became a pastor to pastors. <laughs> In other words, once Zachai reclaimed his true identity in Christ, he became who he was truly supposed to be. Precisely. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, even those of us who've lost our true names and deepest identities. Thank God for Jesus. Grace, will you close us in prayer? God, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus to seek and to save the lost. We thank you that you know our true name. We thank you that you know our true identity. We thank you that you know us and still love us no matter how far we stray. We want to be with you, become like you and do the things you did. Please make us more like you every day. Amen. 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 Let's give these young people a hand. message like that is in our future with our young people. We need to do that. When Karen and I were coming from Wales to London, England on a bus, we had a 20 minute stop and the bus driver announced that don't get off the bus until I do a head count. It's really important. I don't want to lose anyone. So Karen and I were chatting away. In fact, we might have been talking to someone and we didn't notice if he'd done the head count. So then we saw, after a while, we saw people getting up and getting off the bus. So as we walked forward, 
I said to the bus driver, did you do your head count? And he smiled and he said, yes, I did. But I didn't count you because you don't count. And we both laughed. He smiled and he said it in a very friendly way and, and I laughed as well. That kind of a statement, though, the enemy can use to play in your mind. Right? He's right. You don't count. But as I got off that bus, do you know what my father said? You do count. That's what I heard in my heart. You do count. Have you heard that from God? That you do count count. That not just your name, but you count. That he loves you. That he has an identity for you. That he is dying to have a relationship with you. In fact, he did. He died to have a relationship with you. When a fellow named Gord Martin met with the leaders of Radiant and Grace a few months ago, he shared with us that God has 175 names for members of his family. And then he shared just a few of them. If you look on the screen, we are called ambassadors. Aroma of Christ, athletes, believers, body of Christ, born of God, bride of Christ, child of of God, children of light, chosen people, Christians, disciples, family, farmers, flock, God's workmanship, heirs, holy people, holy priests, living sacrifice, royal priests, saints, salt, servants, slaves, soldiers, witnesses. That's just a handful of the 175. I don't know how this morning's message lands on you. It's doubtful that Jesus is going to come and call you a name you didn't know you had. <laughs> but I pray that he does, actually. I pray that you hear this morning that I have made a way so that you could become my son, my daughter, my child, my beloved. I have an identity for you in my son. And I want you to know it. And I want you to live with purpose and a point to life. Apparently, two people a week take their lives in our region. Two people a week. Because they don't have a purpose for living. Or a point to living. They've, they, they do, but they've lost it. There are hundreds of thousands of people living in our region who've never heard that God wants to call them by name and wants to call them to a new identity. May we, first of all, live out of the identity he's given us and then share with others the identity that He has given them. The Westminster Shorter Catechism says this, what is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Have you found your point in living in this statement? My life is about glorifying God and enjoying him forever. And I'll close with this, Isaiah 43, verse 7. God says, everyone whom I created for my glory. That was the purpose and the point of him calling you and I into existence. May God's Spirit unpack for you what this will mean in your life as you live out your days from here forward. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and thank you for that, that little band of young people over there in Wales. Um, God, thank you for um, just the things you're teaching them. Um, just a, a new way of living that is counter-cultural, that is your upside-down kind of kingdom.
not only there in Cardigan, Wales, but here as well and all over the world. God, thank you that in these days you are faithfully calling people to a new identity in Jesus. Father, this world is calling with a loud, loud voice to all sorts of identity um, understandings. But God, thank you that you always speak truth. You're the way, the truth, and the life. So Father, I pray for my friends here online and in person, that Lord, that each one of us would just come before God and say, what is my identity? I really want you to tell me why you created me. What is my purpose? What is it that you want me to do? I know what I'm doing right now. Is it what you want me to do? Do you have other things for me to do? Are there people that you also would like me to share that you have an identity for them in Christ? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen.